Thank you for joining us here online at Hope Church, Boulder City, Nevada. We are honored that you are here, and we believe that God is going to use this service to bless you and many others around the world. Here at Hope Church, we exist to connect people to live a life of a Jesus follower. We believe that a Jesus follower abides in Christ, connects in community, and shares in the mission. There are so many amazing things happening in our church that we'd like for you to be a part of. If you'd like to find out more, please visit us at hopechurchbc.com or you can find us on Facebook at HC Boulder City. On behalf of Hope, we thank you once again for worshiping with us and we pray that you enjoy the service. Hope church Boulder City. This is a new perspective for me. I don't usually stand up in the front. I'm usually out in the lobby welcoming all the kids. I'm Kristen. And we are so glad that you are here today. Uh, it is mid-October. We have the beautiful weather. And um, we're just glad you're here. If you, it is your first time here today, in the lobby, we have these little bags. We would love for you to grab one. It has some gifts for you to just say welcome and let you know a little more about us. And um, we have some special guests here this morning. And it's my pleasure to greet them. So, Pastor Jess, uh, Pastor Jess, Pastor Eric and Jess Shellner are here. They are our new pastor and his wife. So, we're just grateful they're here, and we just wanted to let you see them and hear a little bit from them. Well, thank you, guys. It is it is so good to be with you, and uh, we're not. We're not here permanently yet, unfortunately. We're here this weekend looking at houses, and so we think we've we found one, and so it should just be hopefully a few weeks, hopefully a few weeks before we're, we're with you and uh, staying here with you guys. But we're so thankful for all of you already. Uh, we've, we felt so welcome here. We're from a small town, and so coming to Boulder City and feeling that small town feel has been, it's been amazing. And so it has already felt like home, and we can't wait to be here full time. Our kids are not here with us on this trip. They're with Grandma and Grandpa right now. Actually, Poppy and Gigi, both sets of grandparents, watch them this weekend. Uh, but they are excited to be here, too, because we told them it looks like Radiator Springs. <laughs> and uh, they're, like, they're so ecstatic to be here. They love rocks, and so they're, the fact that most of the yards are covered in rocks are like, are you serious? They can't wait, and we can't wait to introduce them to you. Um, we love you guys already. We've heard about your faithfulness. We've heard about uh, how you're growing in the Lord, and we're so thankful for, uh, for that. Uh, and it's, it's really just a privilege to be here with you today. Uh, I, I want to preach right now, but I'm going to save that for Brother Neil. He's all, all prepared, and I am not. So do you want to say anything? No. Okay. That's surprising. So if we're... <laughs> We're going to be here uh, after the service. We'd love to say hi to you if we, if we haven't already. Uh, we'd love to catch your names. We won't remember them all. I'm sorry. But eventually over the next several decades, we'll get to know you all. All right. All right. All right. And, it's, and now it's shake and howdy time. So take a minute to say those near you. We'll say good morning. And then we'll get started on our day.
All right, well, good morning, Hope Church, Boulder City. As we walk to our seats to worship our Lord and Savior, let's get prepared in Jesus' name. Is filled. Come on, you know this one. The whole earth is filled, filled with your glory, filled with your glory. Come on, my whole life, my whole life is filled. My whole life is filled, filled with your glory. Come on, the whole earth, the whole earth is filled. The whole earth is filled. Filled with your glory. Filled with your glory. My whole life is filled. My whole life is filled. Filled with your glory. Filled with your glory, your love is alive, your love is alive, your love is beating inside of my heart and my soul and my mind. the 
Let's give a praise, church. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. As we read our scripture, Psalms 100, 4 through 5. It says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good and his mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. God, we are so thankful. God, that we can enter into this building freely. God, with no reservations. God, we don't have to look over our shoulders. God, would you help us to give thanks with a grateful heart? God, through your spirit, we acknowledge you in all our ways. God, you said in your word, if we seek ye first the kingdom of God and your righteousness, all these things will be added unto us. So God, this morning, we lift your name high. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm calling on the God of shame. Whose love endures through generations I know that you will keep your covenant I'm calling on the God of Moses The one who opened up the ocean I need you now to do the same thing for me. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. upon the lonely I know with you all things are possible I'm calling on the God of David who made a shepherd boy courageous I may not face Goliath but I've got my own giants. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Come on, oh rock. Oh rock, oh rock of ages. I'm standing on your faithfulness. Your faithfulness. Oh. 
are the same God. You answered prayers back then, and you will answer now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You were providing then. You are providing now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You moved in power then. God moved in power now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You were a healer then. You are a healer now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You were a savior then. You are a savior now. You are the same God. You are the same God. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Come on, a rock. Oh, rock, oh, rock of ages. I'm sending. Take my friend, take my friend, take my fear, all I have, I'm leaving here, be all my hopes, be all my dreams, be all my delight, be my everything, and I will worship. Hi. 
Yes, we are asking that that would be the call on our lives. That we would worship you always. That God, that you would lead us by your spirit. That our hearts and our minds would be centered and focused God, we are so thankful that we get to come into your house and gather in your name to give you the glory, to give you the worship. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. At this time, kids, you are dismissed. Thank you, worship team. Can we give them a hand? As you can see, the next generation is going to be in their study as well. Well, before I start today, uh, I just want to tell you what an honor it is to stand in front of my family to speak for God's glory. Uh, every breath we take is because of God. And it's an honor. This church has so much talent. And when I say family, my family life basically was not the best in my life. I had a brother, half-brother, three half-sisters, and then there's me. So when I call it family, this is my blood family because it's Jesus' blood that has covered us to bring us together. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn. Let me get my glasses on. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, I want you to turn to 2 Peter. 
and this is just kind of a prelude to where we're going today, but I just wanted to share this one scripture with you this morning. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12, now Peter's approaching death. He's getting old, and I can relate to getting old. Somebody else can relate to. Peter says, for this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things. Though you know and are established in the present truth, he says, I am in this tent to stir you up by reminding you, knowing shortly that I must put off my tent just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things. I can't tell you how much I relate to that as a reminder because I'm forgetful and it doesn't get any better. So with that said, I believe the body of Christ continuously needs to be reminded. And I want to just take you through just a little uh, journey here of when I came to Christ. And that was in 1987. My life was in the pits. And in 1987, and before I even start there, I want to share with you what I feel are, are critical musts. Now, I have a real good friend that has a podcast titled Critical Musts. And I really believe it's critical that we understand certain things and what God's put on my heart today. And these musts are a thing that Christians we must honor. God with, for example, his sovereignty his glory, our existence, but also how he grows us and how he purifies us. So I'm going to mix a few things together today which are about warfare, about growth, and about prayer. So in January 1987 in Colorado Springs, Colorado, I surrendered my existence to Christ. It's as if it happened yesterday. I mean, I, I'm speaking now, and I can remember the moment, the minute, everything that took place. As a newborn infant in the Lord, the first year was shocking. It was a shocking trip, to say the least. But at that moment that I surrendered, Billy Graham offered me a book. And the title of that book was Peace with God. I dialed the number, and the book was on its way. I was in need of peace in a big way. As I commenced after I got the book to read the book of, about peace, the first chapter or two was about warfare and the enemy that I would be up against. Now, I'm looking for peace. And now I'm in a war? Well, I'm a Navy veteran. I'm familiar with war, as in Vietnam. But I'll tell you what, the first thing that pops into my mind is that I want every bit of information that I can get to whom I'm fighting. To me, it only makes sense to have that knowledge and what to expect from the adversary. Wouldn't you agree? So 35 years later, and man, does it travel fast. I'm sadly amazed as to the complacency I see in the church while in conflict 
with the enemy. Now, before I go any further, I just want to say this. What we're, what we're having here today is an answer to prayer. We've been praying for our new pastor. And I believe this is the manifestation right now today that he's here with his wife. So, Pastor, wherever you're sitting, I just want to tell you this is answer to prayer, that you're here and that you're going to lead us. And I'm honored to be right here sharing with you as well. So this leads me to believe, as I just said, I'm amazed that the complacency I see in the church is while in conflict with the enemy. And when I talk about church, I talk about the body of Christ, the church all over the world. So with that said, it's a critical must that we must understand the calling of God's people. We must come to terms with our calling that we have as Jesus followers. Now, understanding the Great Commission or assignment or command to take up our cross is a must, as explained in Matthew 28. I'm going to read that, just like Peter, to remind us. Matthew 28, verse 16 through 20. The word of God says, Then the eleven disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain, and where Jesus, where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some of them doubted. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands that I have given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now let's flip over to Mark chapter 16, and let's see how he says it. 16, verse 14, still later he appeared to the 11 disciples, Jesus, as they were eating together. He rebuked them for their stubborn belief because they refused to believe those who had seen him after he had been raised from the dead. Now, I can understand that to a certain degree, but really, when we look at it, I, I don't have a place for it. And then he told them to go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. Anyone who believes is baptized will be saved, but anyone who re refuses to believe will be condemned. Now, Matthew says some doubted, Jesus, and Mark said he rebuked them for their stubborn belief. <laughs> now these were eyewitnesses who walked with Jesus for three years. They were watching him do miracles. They were watching him being apprehended in the Garden of Gethsemane that night when they came to arrest Jesus, the night before his crucifixion. They saw the raising of the dead, the miracles that he performed. They saw all of this, and yet they were stubborn and doubted. They walked with him. They watched all this happen right before their eyes. So 2,000 years later, we're learning about their stubbornness and their doubt. So how does all this stubbornness and doubting relate to warfare? <laughs> I think that's pretty obvious. As it plays a big part in our calling to obedience to Christ and the warfare 
that goes along with it. I would submit to you that warfare and immaturity are the biggest reasons for stubbornness and doubting in the believer's walk. The antidote or the solution, if you will, is intimacy with the one that has called you to worship him. Now, the body of Christ is being purified. We've got afflictions. We've got sufferings. He calls us, and we scratch our heads. But it's being purified for the wedding, and the process of purification is in action. It's going on all around us. Now, in Matthew 28, Jesus said he has the authority to authorize his called ones to spread the gospel. So now we have the authority given to us. He's given us the authority. That's huge. But the church back then with 11 men in the Garden of Gethsemane, even though they, they hadn't heard this Matthew 28 part yet, that night before Jesus was crucified, before he was arrested, he came and asked them to pray for him. And he had to ask them three times because they kept falling asleep. And sadly, 2,000 years later, the church with authority is sleeping and being complacent. All we have to do is look around us in in America, and it's obvious, we, obvious to me, and I believe it is to you, that we need to rise up and pray and use our authority that has been given to us for God's glory. Now, I love the way Tony Evans, some of you have probably heard of Tony Evans, maybe even listened to him speak. I love the way Tony Evans teaches teaches, excuse me, the reason for the church's lack of authority. This is great. Tony says, because of the lack of intimacy between the church and God, it causes a lack of capacity in the believer. And because of the deficient capacity in the believer, the authority is of no merit or value. So here's the formula. The more intimate we are with Jesus, the larger the capacity is in our spirit. Would you agree? <clears throat> so the larger the capacity of knowledge, wisdom, and understanding we carry in our walk, which demands our witness of authority to overflow as the warfare intensifies. Now, if we think it's getting bad now, <laughs> we ain't seen nothing yet. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled, Matthew 5 and 6. Jesus, i got to tell you a story. My precious wife, Darlene, she's, she's the bigger half of this message. I mean, this, this person, not message, but uh, I couldn't do it if I didn't have her prayers as a helpmate. She is just amazing to me. We were in the children's church months ago, maybe six, eight months ago, I can't remember. And we were uh, teaching the group up there. And we were teaching on a topic of getting into the word and consuming the word and, and just, you know, just getting as much of the word because that's, that's God is the word. And... There was a little guy, I can't even remember, I couldn't tell you who he was, he raised his hand. And he says, 
do you mean that we need to eat the word? <laughs> and I'm back there going, yes, we need to eat the word. Because <laughs> Jesus said, eat my body and drink my blood, didn't he? So here we are. More hunger for the word builds more intimacy. And more intimacy equals capacity. Your capacity gets bigger in portion. And the more capacity we have, the stronger we are. So intimacy equals capacity. Capacity equals authority. Let me give you an example. Let's say you want some water. Okay, we got Lake Mead here. So you go down to Lake Mead, but all you have is a cup. You get your cup. So you got people back home that need a cup of water. So you get a cup of water and you take it home. Well, that's all you got. Because that's the only capacity you have. Say you take a bucket. You go down to Lake Mead, get your bucket of water. That's all you can get because that's the only capacity you have, right? Well, say you take a semi-tractor trailer with a tanker, huge. This thing will hold 200 gallon or more than that. <laughs> now we're talking capacity, aren't we? So yes, Intimacy equals the amount of capacity you have. If you're not intimate with God, you don't have much capacity. The bigger, the more intimate you are with him, staying in the word and allowing the growth to come upon you, your capacity grows. And the bigger capacity the more authority you have. Because that's what he's saying to us when he tells us to go. Look what Hebrews 13 says. And what I mean here is you see authority intensifies with boldness for life. But Hebrews 13, five, uh, chapter 13, 5 through 7, this encourages our boldness. Five says, let your conduct, this is big, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. Oops, that's a good one. Be content. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? What have we been going through the past two years? I think there's a lot of fear. Wouldn't you agree? And now it's coming out that it was fraud. It started with an F and it's ending with an F. Fear and fraud. If I could reference any one chapter in any one scripture, that would clarify the kind of intimate relationship needed to expand our capacity. <clears throat> and please God, it would be in the Song of Solomon. Ooh, Neil, where are you going with this? Song of Solomon. Listen to how... <clears throat> Let me back up here. It says, I don't hear many messages preached in this, but the Song of Solomon has a powerful teaching of the gospel. From our surrender to his return. Now, I did a complete study on the Song of Solomon, and I'm like most people, really? But after I got done with it, I'm going to share a scripture here that I think will really help us. 
listen to how the beloved, there's two characters here, the beloved and the Shulamite, meaning Jesus and the bride. The beloved speaks. He's describing his bride-to-be, and he's praising the Shulamite's beauty. Chapter 6, verses 4 and 5 of the Song of Solomon. He starts out, Oh, my love. He's talking to the bride. Oh, my love, you are as beautiful as Teresa. Anybody know what that is? I don't. But I got to think it's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> he says it's lovely as Jerusalem. Awesome as an army with banners. Hold it right there. He's calling it an army. Her beauty is like an army. Now, if you've got an army, aren't you in a war? Are you protecting the war from coming in and destroying? Something like that anyway. Awesome as an army with banners. Now, here's where, I, here's where it just gets me. Verse 5. Turn your eyes. Away from me, the beloved says to the bride, for they have overcome me. What? The beloved is ravishing her with his confidence that she is his and only his. Let me read this scripture, verse 5, in the New Living Translation. It says, turn your flashing eyes away from me, for they have confused me and overcome me. But I really like the way the message puts it. Your beauty, verse 5, your beauty is too much for me. I'm in way over my head. I'm not used to this. I can't take it in. Now, some theologians have different opinions about this scripture. But bottom line, God is not confused. And nothing will ever overcome him. But with that said, God created his bride to love him forever. And his bride's focus, that's what's happening here, she is focused on him. Are we focused on God like that? She's focused on him as much concentrated on him as he is on her. They are one together. Now that's a big expression right there, one. We see that in John 17. He talks about oneness as in intimacy is the key. John 17, real quickly, he says, make them ready for your service, and Jesus talking to the Father, make them ready for your service, service through your truth. Your teaching is truth. I have sent them into the world just as you have sent me into the world. Father, I pray that all who believe in me can be one. You are in me and I am in you. I pray that they can also be one in us. Then the world will believe that you sent me. I have given them the, uh, the glory that you gave me. I have given them this glory so that they can be one. Just as you and I are one, I will be in them and you will be in me. So they will be completely one. Then the world will know that you sent me and that you loved them just as you loved me. Five times. One. Oneness. The body is to be one as Christ and the Father are one. Oneness. 
So in warfare, we have an indivisible enemy to contend with. In Ephesians 6, I'll read that real quick to you. Paul pressures now. He's pressuring the Ephesians. Directs, he directs these Gentile Christians to how to behave themselves in the spiritual warfare with the enemies of their soul. So we just got through the Song of Solomon about love and the calling on our life before that. And now we're in war and we're going, what? Paul is, is telling these Ephesians how to behave themselves in spiritual war. Verse 10 of Ephesians 6, a final word, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put all of God's armor on so that you will be able to stand firm against the strategies of the devil. He says, pray in the spirit all times and all occasions. Stay alert and be persistent. Praying, praying for all believers everywhere and praying for me too, Paul. Paul says, ask God to give me the right words. I prayed that prayer. Ask, I was asking God to give me the right, right words today. Now, do you know, do you realize where Paul was when he wrote the scripture to the Ephesians and to the uh, Colossians? Paul, he was waiting to be beheaded in a Roman dungeon. So who is this invisible enemy or evil spirit? As I ask the question, I know some people will say, but Neil, of course, everyone knows that there's a devil. And that's right. And the devil is a real person. Look what John 8, 44, how Jesus describes him. In John 8, uh, 44, Jesus is being confronted with the Jewish uh, bunch that uh, were trying to put him down. He says, he says, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. You see, the devil is their daddy. There's so much that needs to be learned and passed on to the generations to come about the devil and no age group needs it taught more, plainer, and, uh, and untarnished, with an untarnished truth than this generation in 2022. I feel there's a lack of spiritual growth going on like never before. All we gotta do is look around our country. Low aims in the spiritual life and satisfaction with the present circumstances also create an exposed condition in the church. Satan will attack the strongest and most mature giant of pride, but he works his destruction and gains his rewards where the Christian slumbers in the cradle of spiritual babyhood. Spiritual growth along with constant sure development are the surest safeguards against Satan's assaults. Constant growth is a must. Now we need uh, the light of the truth as a warning, and that's what this is. As an incentive to be watchful, as an inspiration to motivate us, we need the knowledge, wisdom, and understanding about this enemy and his character and presence and powers. This is maybe the most critical moment on the planet Earth, I feel. And I like what E.M. Bounds says. Ian Bounds is a powerful man of prayer. Ian Bounds addresses the church's most vulnerable areas. Quote, nothing promotes Satan's work more than skillful hands. Let me say that again. Nothing promotes Satan's work more with more skillful hands than to be ignorant of Satan and his ways. To escape his snare, we must have strong faith that he exists. We must also have an intimate knowledge of his plans. I would submit to you that maybe one of the weakest areas in our lives as Christians is an unforgiving spirit. 
Paul brought this out, in, out into the open uh, so that we could aggressively ob obstruct Satan's plans in 2 Corinthians 2, 10 and 11. He says, if you forgive anyone anything, I too forgive. And what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, it has been done for your sake in the presence of Christ. To keep Satan from taking advantage of us so we are not to be ignorant of his schemes. Unforgiveness. If we have unforgiveness, Satan just moves in. When Satan generates an unforgiving spirit in us, then he has us. And now we are on his ground. As soon as the spirit of unkindness possesses us for the wrong done to us, Satan has the upper hand. Now we're at spiritual growth. Growth is a critical must. Back to Peter. Peter says, <clears throat> and this is good. Peter says in 2 Peter 1, 3 through 9, by his divine power, God has given us everything we need for a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know him, the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable us to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human, human desires. Now listen to this. In view of all this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. Supplement your faith with generous provisions of moral excellence and moral excellence with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with patient, big word, patient, patient endurance and patient endurance with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love for everyone. The more you grow like this in verse 8, the more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But those, don't miss this, but those who fail to develop in this way are short-sighted or blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their old sin. Now we get into prayer. I believe prayer is probably the biggest weapon that we've got against the enemy. Real quickly, I want to give you an A.W. Tozer quote. I love Tozer. A.W. Tozer says, prayer at its best is the expression of total life. Such Prayer can only be a result of a life, don't miss this, of a life lived in the spirit. All things being equal, our prayers are only as powerful as our lives. Can you say amen to that? The Bible says in 1 Thess Thessalonians 5, Paul writing, he says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything, everything, that word everything and all, they kind of go together, don't they? Give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. What's the will? Pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Do we talk to the ones we love? Hopefully, the answer is yes. This is a no-brainer, right? We talk to all kinds of people all the time. But bottom line, prayer is communicating with God. What a privilege it is to pray or, pray or talk with the creator of everything. Isn't that, isn't that a good thing, to talk with the creator personally, one-on-one? -on -one? 
that made everything, everywhere. There was never anything without him. Having conversation with the Lord all day long. There are over 400 verses of scripture in the Bible about prayer. I want to read just a few as, as we wrap it up here. But let me show you the book of Jude, verse 20. It's the only, <clears throat> he's only got one, one chapter, Jude 20. He says, but you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying, here it is again, in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for mercy of our Lord Jesus unto eternal life. And then again, and Brother James, I love Brother James. James, he, he just gets right down on it. James 5, 16 in the Amplified. He says, therefore, confess your sins to one another. See, that's huge when you pray. You don't want to have a bunch of sin hanging on you when you pray. Confess your sins to one another. Amplified says false steps, false, your false steps and your, and your offenses. And pray for one another that you may be healed and restored. You see, the heartfelt and persistent prayer of a righteous person can accomplish much. Or other words, when put into action and made effective by God, it is dynamic and can have tremendous power. I say, let's pray. Oh, Lord. You are just so awesome, so wonderful. Father God, there's no words that can describe how great you are. And you said in Revelation 8, 4, and the smoke and fragrant aroma of the incense with the prayers of the saints, God's people, ascended before God from the angel's hands. Lord, that means that when we pray, Lord, that our prayers go right into the throne room of heaven. You're there listening. You're there watching. You're there. You're omnipresent, Father God, Lord Jesus. You're omnipotent. Lord, you have given us the authority. You have given us room to be intimate with you. You want our focus to be on you and you alone. Yes, we have this life to live, but it's for you that we live it. We're vessels, vessels only to be used by you, Lord. Vessels that you can use throughout a lost and dying world, Lord. We just thank you today, Father God, that there are still healings to be done. There's still salvation to be had. There are still people who have not given their hearts to the Lord that are still uncleansed. So we just, we come to you, Father God, needing more of you in a more intimate way that would build our capacity huge and that we could fulfill the commission that you have commanded us to do. Father God, we just thank you. I lift up everybody in this sanctuary this moment and the kids that are above us in the classrooms. I just pray right now that you'll touch all of our hearts and grow us and show us. And I do it in your precious name, Jesus. Amen.
guess a couple of announcements here. First and foremost, uh, Neil, your message made me think a, a while back I would, at the main campus, I was sitting there, Vance Pittman was pastoring then, and he said, one of the most powerful prayers we can have for other folks is to pray that they get just somewhat more intimate with, with God. That's the prayer for other folks, that they will just grow in their intimacy with God. So that really reminded me of that. So thank you for your message today, Pastor Neil. Uh, a couple of announcements, just some things going on. You guys can read as well as I can say it. Uh, Awana. There's one group at Awana that's pretty misbehaving. That's my group, me and Joel. Our group misbehaves a lot. We have a lot of fun. Awana, if you have kids and they're not a part of Awana, please talk to Kristen about it. It is a lot of fun. And they're learning about Jesus. Uh, youth. Uh, we also have the youth the same night as Awana. That's from 6.30 to 7.45. And again, the youth have a lot of fun there, too. Uh, some Bible studies that we have going on. Uh, again, you guys can read it. The Ageless Inspiration one is up there. I believe that one is Tuesdays, right. All right. Um, Neil, your Bible study every Wednesday, correct? Focusing on end times. Yes. Uh, the ladies' Bible study this Thursday, and it is, uh, it is on this week, right? It is on this week, so this Thursday. Um, finally, a couple of things. Um, offering, you guys know we do the offering. Do we have a thing to show how we do the offering like Pastor Don used to do? No, no. We got the things in the back, we got an app, and we got mail. All right. Hey, you guys want to hear something odd? Numbers not divisible by two. Well, you non-math majors think about that terrible joke and how I can now be assured that I will never be asked by the new pastor to do announcements again. Um, I did want to say, I don't know if any of you are part of the uh, Boulder City Neighborhood Connection on Facebook. Uh, there was a post just, to, I think it was even yesterday, that said, somebody just posted, hey, where's a great place for families in Boulder City? Did you, if you guys saw it, it was, I think the first 12 responses were, Hope Boulder City, Hope Boulder City. So... We're doing something right here. God's working here. Um, and lastly, certainly not leastly, two weeks from today, I don't know if we have the flyer up for, the, for that right there. We've got to chill. So there will be one service on October 30th. Uh, we will have, uh, afterwards, we're going to do the chili, chili cooking, bring, uh, bring BYOC. Um, we're going to be doing some pumpkin carving. And so BYOP on that as well. And they're just going to be, again, no second service that day. Everything's going to be right afterwards on that. So uh, with that, let me just leave you with this. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord, the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. And once again, in the words of Pastor Don, go and serve your king. You guys are dismissed.